Good evening and welcome once again to He's Alive, 40 days of preaching, teaching and prayer. We are so thankful that you have chosen to be with us tonight. Tonight we are broadcasting, broadcasting from Spokane Valley Adventist Church in Spokane Valley, Washington. And once again, I wanna thank you so much for choosing to be with us tonight. It has been almost 40 days of, of us gathering each night to spend some time talking about ministry. Tonight we have, um, we are looking forward to completing, we are on night 36 and we are almost to the end. We have talked about so many different ministries, anything ranging from children's ministry, we have talked about marriage ministry, we have talked about community service. So we have really spent some time chatting and discussing, talking about what does ministry look like? What is God calling us to in regards to ministry? So we are thankful that you have joined us tonight. Once Again, I want to mention to you guardrailsmedia.com. Remember, it's our social community that is being put, put together by He's Alive TV, where all of our sessions are housed. All of our sessions that we are having are housed on the social community um, website. We want you to be able to go there, guardrailsmedia.com. You can register as an individual. You can also register as a church community and just go there and find a rich resource of um, ministry ideas, ministry thoughts go there and just take a gander through if you have questions leave a comment or and they'll, we'll get back with you um, so remember guardrailsmedia.com um, we tonight um, want to welcome one of our speakers tonight she started last night Claudia Allen it has been such a delight getting to know this delightful young lady um, she is here um, be with us from Michigan. Claudia Allen actually is an activator, a writer, a speaker, and a teacher for justice. Claudia is passionate about activating the activist in all of us. So her, her message last night was so interesting as she talked about Jesus and the blood, the blood cries in scripture. She put that together and we just, we're thankful for that. Um, Claudia has been passionate about the work of justice and equality for years, but believes she made her first mark during her senior year at Andrews University. In fulfillment of the change project requirement for the undergraduate leadership program, Claudia created and successfully imp implemented an African-American studies minor housed out of the Andrews University Department of History. Um, this project made Claudia the first student to graduate from Andrews University with a minor in leadership and the first undergraduate student to successfully amend a curriculum at the institution. After earning her BA degree in English and her minor in leadership in 2000, 2013, Claudia went on to Georgetown University, where she subsequently um, graduated with her master's in English in 2015. Currently, Claudia is a PhD student at the University of Maryland Department of English. Um, her research is invested in how critical race theory, African American studies, literary theory, and theology all inter intersect in African-American literature. We're just so thankful that she's here with us. Um, she has published articles on justice in religious and non-religious magazines and journals, including but not limited to the Rationale Online, Spectrum, Adventist Today, and Message Magazine. She has preached at churches and schools across North American divisions, Adventist regional conferences since the age of 12 and was a keynote speaker for Andrews University's Social Conscious Consciousness Summit, various forums and conferences for Adventists for Social Justice, the Black Adventist Religious Scholars and Conference, and served as a keynote speaker for the inaugural MLK celebration at Southwestern Michigan College. Um, whether through guest appearances on Hope Channels, Cross Connections, or co-hosting on her own news podcast, Racially Motivated, Claudia is dedicated to activating people to do justice, love mercy and walk humbly with God. Her favorite scripture in um, Philippi is Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So she has shared with us, we've been out um, each evening just spending some time together, and she has just shared with us her heart, um, what's on her mind, and we are just so thankful that she has stopped in her busy schedule to come and spend time with us and to share with you. Before she comes out, I would just first like to have prayer with, with you all. Let's bow our heads. 
it. Father, we come before you today. We're so thankful and we're grateful that you are our God. We love you, Father. We thank you for all it, all it is that you do on our behalf. Father, help us to love you. Help us to love justice. Help us to love mercy. Um, help us to walk humbly with you. We thank you so much as you, you um, are with us tonight. And please be with Claudia as she shares your message on social justice. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be back with you for a second night for part two of Activate Social Justice According to the Gospel of John. Last night we were introduced to the topic of justice and the Bible, looking through it though through the story of Cain and Abel. And tonight we're going to begin our journey through the Gospel of John to really see just how Jesus practiced activism. So, if you don't mind, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles or slide with me in your devices on over to the book of John, and we are going to begin right in the very first chapter, John chapter 1. But again, this evening, we're just going to have one verse. That verse is going to be taken from verse 14. Now, many of you have known or heard this passage read, um, and it reads as follows, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, what does the word becoming flesh have to do with activism? What does the word becoming flesh have to do with social justice? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's break this thing down together. But first, if you don't mind, let's have another word of prayer. God, I thank you for this moment and for this opportunity to commune with you and to learn from you. So God, your words are on my tongue. Speak through me in this moment. May someone be saved as a result of your message. In Jesus' name, amen. First, let's look at a good definition of activism, right? If we're going to think about the fact that activism speaks, then we're going to have to take into very real consideration what activism is. Now, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, activism is a doctrine or practice that emphasizes direct, vigorous action, especially to one side of a controversial issue. Uh, but Amherst College defines defines activism as an intentional action with the goal of bringing about social change. So that if we define social justice as the belief in an equitable, compassionate world where difference is understood, valued, and respected, then we can see that social activism and social justice are flip sides of the same coin. Social action, work, or activism is a way to meet the goal of social justice. In other words, activism is committed to intentionally manifesting social justice through both doctrine or ideology, as well as through a variety of practical hands-on methods. Those methods can be through protests and rallies, prayer vigils and letter writing, preaching and book publishing, or even genuine authentic relationship building. But at the heart of activism is consistent and intentional action. But if we're honest, activism is a trigger word. It carries a lot of baggage for many people. For some, the very sound of the word serves as a clarion call, galvanizing all inspired to participate in various acts of resistance to promote justice for the disadvantaged. For others, activism is a word that denotes exclusivity. Some find the word to be reserved for a select few who have demonstrated a long-term devotion not simply to justice and equality, but political justice and equality in particular. It's reserved for those who champion voting rights and boycotts. 
the deconstruction of the, the school to prison pipeline and the exploitation of cheap labor. It seems to be a word that connotes direct opposition to not just the status quo, but the laws and policies of what some may perceive is an unjust government. I will not put forth a lie and say that activism does not champion any of those causes, nor does it uh, manifest itself in any of those ways, because it does. I won't even try to pretend as though activism is not often direct opposition to systematic injustice from various institutions, just like the government. But what I would like to suggest is that activism is more than a series of political actions that combat an oppressive governing body. I'd like us to see that true activism is the practice of placing oneself in direct opposition to any entity or power that abuses, exploits, marginalizes, or intentionally disenfranchises any human being for any reason. In that sense, Activism opposes unjust people, unjust ideas, unjust policies, and unjust institutions. It is a commitment to enacting justice across a variety of lines using a variety of means. It is birthed from compassion and it believes that all people should be offered the same opportunities. It purports that all people should have access to dignity, that dignity is not a privilege for some, but instead the platform upon which all of humanity has the right to stand. What is needed is a Christ-like activism. What is needed is a kind of activism that intentionally descends into the condition of the disenfranchised to rebuke the oppressor, restore the oppressed, and ultimately provide a replacement to the system that promoted those injustices in the first place. We need an activism that combats injustice with words made flesh. We need an activism that speaks like Jesus. One of the reasons why we need an activism that speaks like Jesus is because the injustices in our societies were instituted by language. I'd like to actually take it just a little step further. Our societies as a whole, were constructed by language. In fact, the Bible begins by letting us know that all of creation was made not by the hand of God, but by the word of God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God said. And the Bible continues documenting a song written by King David in Psalms where he declares that he, speaking of God, spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And as this ancient book comes close to its conclusion, the Apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Hebrews that it is by faith that we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, pun intended, God created the heavens and the earth with words, with language, with his very speech. But when God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't just bring a new world into being. He spoke and created a whole new language. After God created everything with language, they desired for humanity to participate in that language. This divine language that possessed the power to create also possessed the innate characteristic of being relational. The origin narrative as recorded in Genesis documents that God invited Adam to join their speech community by giving him the opportunity to name all of creation. The Bible says that out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. <laughs> 
And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. Here we see a beautiful exchange between God and man. That which God created, they are now entrusting with the very power to name as a means of bonding with him. God's way of bringing Adam into speech community with them was to allow him to possess the words of their new language, was to give him the power to compose words for their new language. But when Eve had a conversation with the serpent, She compromised this new relationship that she, Adam, and God were experiencing together. Their opportunity to commune and converse with one another with words and language that was pure, that was holy, has now been compromised because now, based on Eve's conversation, now words like deception and disobedience are now introduced into a divine language that was never supposed to understand sin, a divine language that was never meant to utter sinful words. This actualized what I call sin language. And sin language is a system of words or signs that when articulated and actualized through speech and action, create distance between God and humanity. In the same way the world blossomed at the immediate articulation of the word, so too did Eden immediately wither at the articulation of sin language. Genesis 3 verses 7 through 8 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now up to this point, Adam and Eve had never seen or heard of shame. They had never seen or heard of fear. Sin language shifted God's divine linguistic system when it introduced sin-based words. Humanity now felt the need to speak the language of guilt and covering, and God now needed to speak the language of interrogation and judgment. A community that thrived off of gratefulness was now introduced to words like discontent. A community that thrived off of vulnerability was now thriving off of words like covering. Such words were never meant to exist in the language shared between God and humanity. One conversation created an alternate existence for all of creation. One conversation produced sin-based words and set in motion a society whose only path was self-destruction. One conversation caused a world created for immortality to be restricted by death. One conversation caused a world created for eternal life to be destined for destruction. The moment sin language was introduced into a world created by words, that world was forever changed because sin language constructed a self-destructing world that God never intended. Sin language is the reason we understand and construct a world around us that is rooted in evil and imperfection. Rather than naming our societies based on the deep knowing and love that we have for God and one another, we construct societies and name societies for the purpose of dominance naming one another only as a means of exercising power over each other. For example, eventually, as many of us know, 
Humanity set up systems to create and maintain social hierarchies. No longer living in a garden community with God that thrived on equality. Now we needed to differentiate ourselves, not just from the animals, but now from one another also. We needed to justify why some could exercise dominance, but others could not. The sin language of race was born when we began naming one another, severing the relationship inherent to belonging to the human family. Jim Wallace argues in his book, America's Original Sin, that such produced, quote, America's original sin, which was the theft of land from indigenous people who were either killed or removed as well as the enslavement of millions of African Americans who became America's greatest economic resource. This means that it's because of sin language that the Native Americans were exterminated. It was because of sin language that slavery was enacted. It was because of sin language that the Irish were demeaned. It was because of sin language that the Chinese were overworked and underpaid. It was because of sin language that the Jews were slaughtered. It was because of sin language that African Americans hung from trees. And it is still because of sin language that Muslims aren't trusted, that Mexicans aren't granted citizenship, and that segregation is preferred. Racial injustice is the result of Adam and Eve trusting in the lies of God over the love, in the lies of Satan over the love of God. This means that the fight against injustice is a fight against sin language. We are not simply combating the evil things that people do. We are combating the evil words and concepts that people articulate through speech and action in word and flesh. See, because sin was introduced into the world through language, our salvation had to come into the world through language. Because our injustice is rooted in language, our social justice must be rooted in language. God, in their infinite wisdom, understood that salvation from sin language had to come in a form that was both familiar with language and yet powerful enough to overcome the sin infecting it. So the word became flesh. God became salvation language. He became the spoken and enacted words that restore our relationship to God through rebuke, through restoration, and ultimately a replacement of sin language. In other words, when Adam and Eve took the detour of disobedience, God said rerouting. John begins his gospel by revealing that Jesus Christ was salvation language by identifying him as the word, the very sound utterances of God. As the heartbeat of God's speech within the word was encapsulated the very speech of God. John writes that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That first clause of John's first sentence, in the beginning was the Word, speaks to the importance of the time and space within which the Word operated. Stating that the word was with God in the beginning rather than at the beginning, John tells us that the beginning he is referring to was not a specific time set in motion prior to the, to the presence of the word. Instead, it was a time that came into existence because of the presence of the word. A.Z. Tozer argues that God had no beginning because beginning is a creature word that implies that God himself would have to have been created. 
according to Tozer, quote, in the beginning was the word, does not speak to the creation of the word, but rather speaks to the creation of time, space, creatures, and beings, end quote, by the word. This supports John's assertion that the word was not simply at the beginning, creating the beginning with God, but that he was God. The word was God. Therefore, even the linguistic system that God created from and operated within knows no beginning. Simply put, before anything was the word and God were. Over time, though, humanity grew so accustomed to the use and effects of sin language that the language of God became foreign. It was for this reason that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The very speech that created the word of God, the very speech that created all things, put on the flesh of humanity to reacquaint humanity with the character of God. Basically, when God saw the injustice produced by sin language, the compassion of the word of God was activated, and the activism of the word of God was then engaged. It is at that moment that we see the word descend into the condition of fallen humanity by robing himself in their flesh to rebuke and replace sin language. When the word became flesh, the world met Jesus Christ. I believe this is the first and most important principle of Christ-like activism. Because a language that is both spoken and lived, Jesus taught. He taught us salvation language by speaking and actively working against every force and structure created by sin language that sought to steal, kill, and destroy the life that God originally intended at creation. When John introduces his gospel with, and the word became flesh, he reveals to us that the foundation of Christ-like activism is salvation language. This is essential to our understanding of social justice because it foregrounds the principle that activism speaks. Jesus' example of speech that activates social justice is not what we're accustomed to, though. Our understanding of human speech in relation to social justice is often a misrepresentation of what social justice speech really is. Oftentimes, these, these utterances do nothing but arouse emotion and at worst stimulate the mind with flowery platitudes. The inaction that often accompanies social justice speech has caused many to devalue its potency and begin to prioritize a do-something approach as though action can occur apart from speech. Many have grown so tired of oral articulations against afflictions effects that they seek to abandon language altogether and work in silence. I believe that this is a work of the enemy. Understanding the power that language has to create. The devil wants us to believe that if we simply combat society with different behaviors, then we will rectify society's ills. But society was not constructed off of behavior. Society was constructed from language. And so in order to rid society of its oppressive behaviors, the systematic language of oppression must be rebuked and replaced by a systematic language of justice. Salvation language is the only systemic language that both rebukes the oppressor and restores the oppressed. It's the only systematic language that after doing the work of rebuke and restoration begins to do the work of replacement, exchanging the speech of brokenness with the speech of wholeness. To this end, 
Salvation language is a two-part process that consists of articulating real sound utterances that immediately actualize the work of liberation to alter the condition or environment of a person, place, or thing disenfranchised by sin language. When Jesus spoke for social justice, his speech condemned systems of oppression, challenged the sayings of the oppressor, comforted the souls of the oppressed, and changed the social standing of the newly emancipated within society. Jesus' speech was always accompanied with or followed by an action. Jesus' social justice speech always articulated and actualized salvation. John's gospel wastes no time and ultimately immediately begins to evidence how Christ's activism spoke in the very next chapter. After selecting his disciples and attending a wedding, John writes in chapter 2 of his gospel that Jesus went to Jerusalem because it was almost time for Passover. When he came to the temple, he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. During this time, Jews offered sacrifices in the temple to be cleansed of their sins. This was a practice that God requested Moses institute so that the children of Israel could both commune with God and understand that death was the price that must be paid for sin. These sacrifices were to serve as a symbol of the sacrifice Jesus would ultimately offer on the cross as the blood of bulls and rams ultimately could not really remove sin. This meant that Passover was a very special time where many sought to use these sacrifices as means of coming into right standing with God. Passover was a significant religious observance because the Jews reflected on their oppression under Egyptian rule and remembered how God emancipated them through the power of the plagues and the courage of Moses. Passover was not just a festival or a holiday. No, it was an essential part of religious and cultural identity for the Jews. There was no such thing as being a Jew and not participating in Passover. The Jewish leaders realized this and ultimately turned the temple into what some theologians say was a place of religious profiteering and perfunctory ritual. In other words, Passover turned into an opportunity to make money. In his book, The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted, Obery Hendricks provides an in-depth analysis of the corruption of temple sacrifices, stating, quote, the priests had established a lucrative business of exchanging foreign money for Jewish currency and also selling the animals needed for the sacrifices. No doubt this religious market began as a convenience for the Jews who came long distances to worship in the temple, but in due time the convenience became a business, not a ministry. No longer seeking to ensure that people had what they needed to participate in Passover, now people were often restricted from participating in Passover because they could not afford the sacrifices. No longer was sacrificial worship a transformational experience. Now, Passover was a cultural experience reserved for those who could afford it. The irony is that the Jewish leaders were economically exploiting people during a time that was meant to encourage them to celebrate their freedom from economic exploitation. When they were supposed to be reflecting upon how God provided manna in the wilderness, some were starving because they purchased a sacrifice. When they were supposed to be reflecting on how the Lord passed over their firstborn, some were troubled that their poverty caused Passover to pass them. No longer a joyful celebration of freedom, 
Passover had become a stage for the wealthy and a burdensome ritual for the poor. When Jesus comes on the scene and sees that the temple, which was supposed to be the dwelling place of God, had become the hub for economic oppression and systemic injustice, he immediately began to disrupt their business as usual, and he rebuked their practices. The Bible says that when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. A clear rebuke of the religious leaders' practice of economic exploitation and a separation of God the Father's interest in that exploitation. In this moment, Christ both spoke out against injustice against the poor and restored his Father's image as a God who desires that all people have access to his presence. This dismantled the sin language of exploitation and it replaced it with equality. In the cleansing of the temple, we see that Jesus was committed to a social justice that speaks out against the manipulation and exploitation of the poor. But in John chapter 4, we go on to see that Jesus was also committed to crossing cultural divides. After Passover, Jesus left Jerusalem and went to Judea, and there he spoke about his mission and began to baptize. He did not stay long as he needed to return to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. And while going through the city of Samaria, Jesus approaches Jacob's well. He notices a Samaritan woman at the well, so he says to the woman, give me a drink. And the woman responds to Jesus saying, how is it that you being a Jew ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? This conversation gives us a glimpse into the kind of cultural and ethnic prejudice that existed in Jesus' day. While contemporary conceptions of race and racism did not exist during this time, these passages of scripture evidence that there did exist a system of social hierarchy based on culture and nationality. Just by saying that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, this Samaritan woman revealed that the Samaritans were a group of people deemed inferior by the Jews. They were a group of people deemed unworthy of worshiping in Jerusalem. They were marginalized and barricaded to the fringes of Galilean society. What evidences the absurdity of this ethno-prejudice is that the Samaritans were the ancestors of Jacob. When Jesus asserts his ability to give the woman living water, the woman asks in John 4, 12, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and livestock? Identifying Jacob as the father of the Samaritans, this woman unknowingly asserts that whatever their differences, the Samaritans were of the same blood as the Jews. They were of the same physical and religious inheritance as the Jews, which means that their marginalization from cultural and religious life in Jerusalem was completely unfounded. Jesus recognized this, which is why he told the woman, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And those who must worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In essence, Jesus tells this woman that because God is spirit, their segregation and exclusion from man's designated place of worship is irrelevant. Now that the word was made flesh, all people have access to the presence of God. In Jerusalem, neither the poor nor the Samaritan could worship God at the temple. 
God, in the form of Jesus Christ, rebuked the sin language of ethnic prejudice, exclusion, and segregation, and replaced it with the salvation language of reconciliation and inclusion when he allowed his Jewish body to converse with and minister to the root of this woman's social and spiritual need. Just as through one woman's conversation, sin set the world on a path of destruction, one Samaritan woman's conversation set the world on a path toward reconciliation with both God and man. Through the story of the woman at the well, we see that in Christ, there is no room for racial, cultural, national, or ethnic prejudice. In this story, we see that Jesus went out of his way to interact with and save a group of people who were cast to the periphery and labeled as inferior. Because Jesus had a conversation that was viewed as culturally inappropriate, an entire city believed in him as the Son of God. Because Christ had one conversation with a Samaritan woman, he was granted the opportunity to have several conversations with several Samaritan people. The Bible says, so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, but for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. When Christ had one conversation with a Samaritan woman. He stood against ethnic and prejudice, cultural prejudice, by rebuking the injustice of marginalization and replacing such sin language with the salvation language of inclusion and reconciliation. In this narrative, we see that the excuses that black people should witness to other blacks and white people should witness to other whites because they will be more effective in making disciples is not simply absurd, it's anti-Christ. By that frame of mind, Christ would have come into the world to save the Jews and them alone. By that logic, Jesus would have participated in the social practice of ethnic segregation by avoiding anyone different from him. But Jesus, throughout his ministry, makes it a point of challenging cultural and ethnic prejudice early on in his ministry because he recognizes that the core message of his ministry is that God desires a relationship with all of us, regardless of our race, nationality, or heritage. This truth makes it ungodly to erect and ignore the barriers that restrict poor people's access to God. This truth makes it ungodly to economically exploit people under the guise of religious and spiritual obligation. This truth makes it ungodly to marginalize a whole group of people and prohibit them from worshiping with God and their fellow brothers and sisters in the faith because of any physical, cultural, or economic difference. But there's one more example of how John shows us the power of an activism that speaks like Jesus. Now dead for four days, Jesus arrives on the scene with Mary and Martha berating him and his disciples concerned for his life. John writes that Jesus groaning in himself came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take the stone away. And Martha responded, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus reminds Martha that Lazarus is only sleeping and that if she would just believe, then she would see God's power manifested. Praying to his father, Jesus asks that the will of his heavenly father be done on earth 
so that those who were in and at that memorial service might know that he truly was the Son of God. And John writes that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. His narrative wastes no time with lengthy platitudes or explanations. The next thing John writes is that, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. In that moment, The word that spoke structure into formlessness. That word that spoke substance into void. The word that spoke light into darkness. Spoke life into a limp, empty, and dark, dead body. And as the word made flesh, Jesus evidenced that he was God when he demonstrated that his speech possessed the life-giving power last seen at creation's beginning. Today our loved ones, our cities, our country, and our world is desperately in need of an activism that speaks the life-giving word of God into dark and dead places. We live in a world plagued by sin language, and so some of our churches will be corrupted by a greed that encourages them to set up circumstances and conditions for the manipulation and exploitation of those just seeking the presence of God. Because we live in a world plagued by sin language, there will be a separation within the human family so long as we continue to name one another based on our differences rather than partnering with one another, seeing one another as family instead of enemies, seeing one another as children of the same father. Because we live in a world plagued by sin language, the one Creation, created for immortality and eternal life, will experience the consequence of death. For some, that death will be a physical one. But for others, it will be social and maybe even spiritual. For example, when African Americans live in fear of execution at the hand of citizens and public servants, they are socially dead. When immigrants accept payment and food and clothes for fear of being deported, they are socially dead. When young girls live in fear of being abducted and sold for sex, they are socially dead. And when we are bound by the invisible chains of pornography, anger, gossip, the sins that so easily beset us, we are spiritually dead. Jesus, as the Word made flesh, activated into flesh to produce a divine activism that worked for social and spiritual justice. And so I challenge you to speak life into the grave of racism and demand that the wrappings of physical and psychological violence be loosed from black bodies. I challenge you to speak life into the grave of economic exploitation and demand that the wrappings of fear and hiding be loosed from immigrant bodies. I challenge you to speak life into the grave of human sex trafficking and demand that the wrappings of rape and shame be loosed from young girls' bodies. Christ is calling us to activate an activism that speaks up for holistic social justice, an activism that speaks up for and replaces, rebukes, and restores, and sometimes even resurrects. Engaging in activism with speech is not easy. Jesus showed us that when activism speaks, It rebukes every manifestation of sin and replaces it with salvation. He showed us this when he turned over the tables of economic injustice in the temple. He showed us this when he spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well and when he raised Lazarus from the dead. 
It's time we tell the world that Jesus Christ replaced the sin language of this world with salvation language. It's time we speak like Jesus. It's time we have some hard conversations. It's time we seek out with intentionality an opportunity to talk with somebody who we normally wouldn't talk to. Speak life into dead and dying people. People who are dying socially, people who are dead spiritually. It's time that we speak like Jesus. I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer with me. God, the words of my mouth are creating destructive systems in my life and in the lives of others. I need your words to rebuke the injustice within and around me. I need your words to replace sin with salvation in my mind. Replace sin with salvation in my relationship. Replace sin with salvation in my community. Give me the words to rebuke injustice. Give me the power to heal the wounds of victims and the courage to heal victimizers to repentance. Give me the courage to speak when and where your words of injustice are needed. Teach me how to speak like Jesus. It is in your son's precious, holy, marvelous, and magnificent name that we pray. Amen.